as you find our scripture passage for this morning, which is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. If you, as you find that passage, I want to encourage you. We're having some baptisms after our second service next week. And so I do hope that we see you out there. We do them right in front of our church, uh, pretty much on the sidewalk. And you'll see how it works when you're there. But I hope that you will stick around for a while after the service and, and gather and watch and celebrate with the people who are uh, boldly professing their faith. In Christ Jesus. Um, so praise God for those baptisms. That is his doing. And if you're interested in participating, it's not too late. Put something on your connection card. Find me after the service. The passage will be up here on the screen. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to pull that out. Follow along with us. If you are physically able to stand, please stand for the reading of God's word. This is Jesus speaking here in Matthew 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I I had imagined that this should be a very uh, piercing, very convicting passage for many of us, truly, by all of us. And I know that we've talked about last week, we're really good inner lawyers. Um, We're really good at being defensive when we need to hear truth. And so I just pray that your Holy Spirit would break down that defensiveness we can hear what we need to hear. Also, build us back up, encourage us, even as we're convicted. We pray for both of those things, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Two authors that I follow, two Christian authors that I follow online, each had spiritual mentors that suddenly passed away this past week. And being authors, they, of course, had to write tributes to their mentors. Here's an excerpt of a tribute to Clint Clifton. There wasn't a hint of showiness with Clint. There was no facade. He was who he was, settled and comfortable in knowing what his gifts and passions were and how best to deploy them. Clint usually opened our meetings in prayer by saying, Jesus, we love you, as if to make sure no matter what was going on or what challenges our team was facing, It was love for Jesus that motivates all the activity and planning. And it was love for Jesus that propelled Clint into multiple avenues of action, fostering and adopting, loving his wife and five kids, networking with church leaders, and showing hospitality to those in need. Now here's a a tribute to Robert Donadu, and this one included a little, little picture. This is Bob. This morning he stepped into glory. He was not famous. He was never a keynote speaker at a conference. He wrote no books or blogs, and he had no followers on social media. But Bob is a gospel hero. He was my FCA leader in high school when I was far from God. He patiently taught me the gospel while I cut up, made dirty jokes, and disrespectfully distracted others. Yet Bob's love was relentless. He kept praying, kept witnessing, kept teaching. Bob never gave up on me, and for that, I'm eternally grateful in God's perfect timing. He used the seed sown in Bob's ministry of patience to give me life in Christ. And then this past week, the Lord brought a friend of Kristen and I's named Joy to mind. I won't use her last name because last time I checked, Joy is still very much alive and kicking. Joy has a Facebook account, but that's it. And even then, she mainly posts pictures of elk She faithfully and sacrificially serves her church, uses her home for generous hospitality, cares for family members who have experienced very significant health challenges, checks on her neighbors, and takes special interest in people experiencing a range of difficult circumstances. There's a lot of beauty in these accounts, isn't there? Certainly some of that beauty is found in the what, 
the things that Clint and Bob and Joy have been up to, but perhaps even more beauty is found in the how. You know, the faithfulness, the quietness, the obscurity, a how that has nonetheless borne so much fruit despite the lack of public recognition. And yet, we live in an age of personal brand building, platforming, influencing. Success is very often measured according to metrics like total views or total followers. Listen, I, I genuinely believe that there are redemptive, God-honoring ways to be a social media influencer, but isn't it at least a touch disconcerting that apparently 25% of Gen Zers aspire to be influencers, outpacing any other vocation? The, the mental image, you know, of, of millions of people clamoring to be seen and centered vocationally isn't maybe as beautiful as the portraits we were just talking about. And there's something, there's something about it that doesn't sit quite right with us, that, that kind of nags us a little bit, even if we're inclined to joke about it. And certainly this issue isn't just, it's, it's certainly not just out there, it's definitely influencing, we might say, churches. We have Christian celebrities with massive followings online, subject both to public adoration when they do warm-hearted things and public scorn when they tweet the wrong tweet. And we say that, you know, well, this is just part of being relevant. This is part of reaching people who increasingly live on the internet. So today turns out to be such a fine day to consider Jesus' exhortations concerning the beauty of secrecy when it comes to living righteously. In fact, it's a fantastic day to consider this, given the example of righteous living that Jesus uses. We spent all day yesterday doing a seminar about caring for the least of these, and here we are this morning talking about giving to the needy. Two exhortations as we make our way through this passage. Two exhortations, really straightforward. Number one, practice righteousness, and then we're going to modify it a little bit after that. Number two, practice righteousness in secret. Practice righteousness, and then secondly, practice righteousness in secret. So let's get right after it with that first one. Practice righteousness. It's, very, it's really tempting to treat this passage mainly as this sort of don't be like the hypocrites polemic. But that posture breezes right by the very powerful assumption here from Jesus that his disciples will be practicing righteousness. Yes, there are right ways to do it, there are wrong ways to do it, but what is very clear is that disciples will be about it. Notice in verse 2 and verse 3 that Jesus says, when you give to the needy, not if, when you give to the needy, or even back in verse 1, practicing righteousness is assumed, which is why Jesus skips right to the hows instead of building a case for the why or the what. Practicing righteousness, it needs some attention here, lest we conclude that this is, you know, maybe meritorious righteousness of some kind, that we're practicing to gain salvific favor from God. Recall chapter 5, verse 20, an earlier moment in the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus tells his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Or how about chapter 5, verse 48? This was just last week. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The problem with the righteousness, basically holy, set-apart living, the problem with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is that it was righteousness disconnected from genuine heart change. That's really important. 
There were some good faith attempts to follow the law, God's standards. You know, we talk about this, the, the Torah. But these religious leaders were often missing the heart of the law because their hearts were not necessarily close to God. And clearly I'm generalizing here, not every scribe and every Pharisee was in the same place spiritually. And the thing is, righteousness pursued without closeness to God and without genuine heart change, it inevitably it becomes stifled and really, really distorted. Gutting out righteousness in our own power, you know, maybe to be good Christians or for pragmatic moral reasons, it is always fraught because our sinful pride and our, our self-interestedness, those things are such elite saboteurs. Maybe we start with these decent intentions, but those intentions, they end up giving way to very powerful excuses, maybe for living righteously, but not too righteously, not so much that it really starts to cost us something. Or maybe those intentions give way to self-serving motives, to gain social status or, or public acclaim, maybe a, a good reputation in the community. We've said this several times throughout this series. I'm going to say it again. The law exists in very large part to show God's people how they should love God and what it looks like to love their neighbors. But it is exceedingly common for people to commandeer these standards as a means of soliciting adoration and praise, basically superficial love from their neighbors. So this is supposed to show us how to love our neighbors, but then we use these standards to get love and praise from the people we're supposed to be caring for. We might put it like this. Hypocrisy, basically, when we hear this term hypocrisy, it's basically fake or distorted righteousness of some kind. Hypocrisy proceeds from trying to live godly lives without God. So Jesus is calling for a different kind of righteousness. Different because it comes from a different source and therefore entails different motives and a very different and more intensive posture. He's calling for holy, set-apart living that comes from walking with him, from following him. He's calling for deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, commitment in which Jesus becomes our king and reshapes our affections. He's calling for commitment that makes sense despite its costs and despite the potential difficulties we might encounter concerning our external circumstances. He's, he's calling for this commitment because we know that the kingdom of heaven is ours. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. You see this refrain in the Beatitudes. Proximity to Jesus turns out to be the wellspring of righteousness that exceeds that of the religious leaders. Proximity that is gained by surrendering to that king in humble repentance, basking in the king's compassion, in grace as you walk with him daily and looking forward to the heavenly kingdom. But not only does this righteousness come from our proximity to Jesus as his disciples and accordingly his proximity to us, this righteousness becomes a very critical indicator that we are Jesus' disciples bound for the kingdom of heaven. When disciples encounter the generosity of God in Christ, we're talking about the Christ who gave this Sermon on the Mount as he was heading to the cross. When we encounter this generosity, it changes our hearts and it catalyzes righteous living that includes radical, sacrificial generosity. In fact, and this is, I don't know, maybe bold, but it's true. There is not a biblical category for true disciples of Jesus who don't live generously. 
I'm not a huge fan of language that, that speaks of generous living or, or sacrificial love for our neighbors or pursuing justice as, as gospel issues because I think that language is just too vague. But we can certainly say this. Here's what we can say. Righteousness proceeds from true discipleship, although usually in fits and starts. Definitely don't be expecting this really neat you know, linear progression. It'll be rough along the way. Righteousness proceeds from true discipleship. And if it, if it doesn't proceed at all, or if it looks like the righteousness of the hypocrites, verse 2, it likely means that, A, we don't understand the good news concerning the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed. See Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Or, B, it means maybe we understand this news intellectually. It's in our heads but it hasn't made its way to our hearts. We know about it, but we don't really know it. Already in our series and the Sermon on the Mount, we've investigated several categories, you might say, of righteousness, uh, like dealing with anger, lust, marriage and divorce, integrity, loving our enemies. Here Jesus is beginning kind of a new sequence, and he's talking about kind of spiritual righteousness. You'll see him deal um, here, of course, with giving to the needy, and then prayer, and then, and then fasting. But here in this passage, Jesus is talking about giving to the needy, verse 2 and 3. Needy being a pretty broad label referring to people experiencing financial or material lack. You know, we all have needs, but the needy here have aggravated unmet needs for one of many possible reasons. True disciples will give to people who are needy so generously that it absolutely affects the way that they live. Catalyzing this countercultural lifestyle that actually might make us look strange in the eyes of the world. In fact, if, if you become a Christian and your habits don't change at all, you know, you keep spending the same amount of money on nights out and vacations, your weekend rhythms look exactly the same, you, know, you, you don't start spending more time with people who are in need, if those kinds of rhythms don't change at all, something is probably wrong. And notice this, it's not so much that the, the amounts that matter, but it's our hearts. It's our posture. And you know, we, we won't all be about the same thing. Some of us might go all in on caring for those who are experiencing homelessness. Some of us might go all in on, on fostering. Talk about, by the way, something that will definitely affect your habits and rhythms. But we will all be about something. Focusing first on the spiritual needs and the physical needs and the emotional needs within our own community and then progressing outward. And the reason for that is we can't care very well for people out there if our own house is in shambles, if there's fractures and dissension and so forth. Two possible pitfalls before we move on here. Uh, one for each of the sort of unfortunate opposing camps that tend to emerge among Christians concerning caring for people on the margins. Pitfall number one, beware the temptation to be so passionate about avoiding hypocrisy that you basically throw the baby out with the bathwater. For example, virtue signaling is certainly problematic when it's analogous to the hypocrisy that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 6. But church, it is entirely possible to be so consumed with calling it out that calling it out becomes more of a priority than actually practicing righteousness or perhaps we occupy ourselves with calling it out because we're hoping to avoid practicing righteousness. Criticism is a really great way to, dis to disguise inactivity. Pitfall number two. Beware the temptation please, to employ your own cause to shame others who are invested in different things. 
you know, before you say something like, you know, all Christians must, you know, fill in the blank with whatever you're passionate about, fostering, ministering to those experiencing homelessness, consider that there are only so many hours in a day and nobody can do everything. The body of Christ is not meant to be this place where individuals take up passions and shame other people for not following their lead. It's meant to be a spiritual community consisting of people with all kinds of different gifts and abilities who are actually rallying around each other to help each other figure out how can you be a blessing to this body and how can you be a blessing to this city. But there is a strong critique and a correction here from Jesus that we do need a way, especially in light of the, the influencer platforming follower patterns that we alluded to earlier. So, I don't know, let's spend 10 minutes bashing Instagram, shall we? Um, not really, but kind of. So here's our second exhortation. So, so we do, we practice righteousness, but we do so in secret. We're going to be kind of hard on these religious leaders again. This will be three weeks in a row, if you're keeping track at home, of us being hard on the religious leaders. So let's remember, and this is really important, that these leaders may well be holding mirrors that reflect the state of our own hearts. So be really careful. We do not dare treat passages like these as occasions to be scornful of other people or self-congratulatory. Honest heart investigation is, is always in order when we hear about these issues ascribed to the Pharisees and other religious leaders. Jesus makes it clear that some, not all, but some of the religious leaders in his day had gone, I mean, all in on public righteousness. Instead of simply giving to the needy, they tooted their own horns, first two, in the synagogues and in the streets, Literally, that they might be praised by other people. i got to tell you that toot is a very funny word right now in the Flanagan household. In fact, if you have a particularly bad GI day, someone might call you a tootosaurus. <laughs> These guys were tootosauruses, or tootosauri, I don't know. And I'm actually using that language very intentionally because Jesus was basically, maybe not mocking, that might be too strong, but he was, he was certainly lampooning them. I mean, who knows if these leaders literally gathered a trumpet parade, you know, to publicize their generosity, but they were at least doing it figuratively. So Jesus uses this trumpet language intentionally to expose just the, the absurdity of what they were doing. And I mean, you... You can already see the problems with this behavior. I mean, this is, this is glory stealing of the highest order. I mean, you're diverting glory to yourself. They should be God's alone. By the way, it harms the people who are praising you because now you're distracting them from true worship of God. Centering yourself, when you center yourself, you are always decentering God which is honestly about as bad as it gets for spiritual leaders who are supposed to be pointing people to God. And it's a devastating form of self-deception. It's a means of convincing yourself, maybe because people are adoring you and, and praising you, maybe because there is some sort of public fruit that aligns with your ministry. It can be a very deceptive means of convincing yourself that you're flourishing spiritually when your soul is actually rotting. And what's the reward for this kind of behavior? Verses 1 and 2. Your reward is nothing. Aside from maybe the praise you're desperately courting. People, you know, taken in by your antics, they might reward you in some way through their praise. But God won't. And this might even imply judgment from God, seeing as there's really no neutral ground with him. And, and the hypocrisy that's described here concerning these these leaders, is, is very concerning. When we practice righteousness, especially considering the focus of this passage, when we give to the needy, church, are we thirsting for praise and affirmation? Because that's really the issue here, even more than the trumpeting. 
personal PR campaign are symptoms of diseased hearts that have not been fully captured by the Lord. People who are amazed by God and His generosity toward us in Christ don't clamor for the amazement of other people. People who are satisfied in the Lord don't need praise from others to be filled. In fact, they are so filled by the Lord that they can sacrificially pour themselves out for the benefit of other people without expecting anything in return. And oh, by the way, they are 100 times more joyful than the praise seekers. Quick aside, if you are, if you are following a kind of self-aggrandizing you know, Christian on social media who's constantly uh, centering themselves and building their personal brand, there is a decent chance that you're actually following a rather miserable person. If you want to follow a joyful person and possibly have that joy nourish your own soul, because of course we are, we are influenced by the people we follow, so if you want to follow a joyful person and possibly have that joy nourish your own soul, go have coffee with a, with a Clint or a, or a Bob or in God's providence, a joy. Go spend time with someone who's, who's been around the block, who's experienced some, some fiery trials, and emerge from it with their faith intact. And some of you might say, you know, I don't really know anyone who fits this description, lots of possible answers for that, but here, I mean, just drive 50 miles that way to the villages, right? Go raid the villages. Bring your golf clubs. <laughs> if you're looking to do some really honest heart diagnostics, and every one of us should be doing this in light of this passage, if you're looking to do some really honest heart diagnostics, there's a few things that I will encourage you to consider. Number one, involve people who know you well. You will have blind spots. There will be things going on in your life that you cannot see. Involve people in your spiritual community. Go to them and, and say, Hey, people that will be honest with you when they need to be. Say, am, am I a praise thirster? Look at my life. Am I clamoring for approval and affirmation from other people? Number two, if you have social media accounts, review them. I don't want to belabor this too much, but man, if your righteousness is regularly making its way you know, to Instagram, often in sort of clever indirect ways, maybe via the almighty humble brag. If that's happening, it's spiritually concerning, and it's inconsistent with true discipleship. It's inconsistent for individuals, and it's inconsistent for church communities who are constantly sounding off about themselves. You know, so blessed to be at this charity auction last night. Not anymore you aren't. And then number three, do opportunities to be seen affect the decisions that you make concerning generosity? In other words, as much as we all might enjoy a nice gala, do you like galas more than sitting with someone for an hour on a park bench, helping them fill out job applications? Which one of those things really grabs your heart? But there's a possible objection here, which is fascinating. You know, you could say, Chipper, aren't we supposed to let our light shine? You know, I mean, didn't we just read earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 16, these words from Jesus when he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So which is it? Are we letting our light shine or are we shutting it down? I think it's really important to notice that this light shining that's talked about in Matthew chapter 5 glorifies the Father Whereas the trumpeting that Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter 6 glorifies us. I saw one author put it, I think, very insightfully like this. This is really helpful. Show when tempted to hide. Hide when tempted to show. Show when you're tempted to hide. Hide when you're tempted to show. Or to put it yet another way, show Jesus and hide your darn self. 
Here's the alternative that Jesus is calling for concerning generosity to the, to the needy. He gives us this alternative here in verses 3 through 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Do you see how emphatic Jesus is being here? The right hand, in other words, think of this, the dominant hand should take generous actions, should do generous actions so secretly that your own left hand doesn't even know about it, not to mention members of the general public. This is very figurative language, so we want to be careful that we're not setting up some sort of legalistic standards here based on what Jesus is saying. But the energy in what Jesus is saying is just off the charts. You can hardly be too secretive. If you're in doubt, it's, if it's a gray area, Lean into secrecy. I realize that this might be pretty anxious counsel, which is a real danger here. You know, you might hear all of this and think to yourself, oh man, okay, so here's what I need to do. I need to delete all of my social media accounts today. They're all gone, you know? Or maybe you say something like, you know, I'll I'll tithe exclusively online so that no one will see me. Drop anything into that box in the back. You could interpret this as really anxious counsel. So I actually want to reframe things a bit as we close so that we might leave here really refreshed and encouraged in Christ Jesus. And this is really, this is really important. One of the headlines here, when you hear the secrecy counsel, is that church, it is so possible It is so possible to be so content and joyful in the Lord that you don't even have an appetite for the kind of praise and affirmation that the religious leaders long for. Do you see this? You can be so satisfied in the Lord, so swept up in the joy of the Lord, that you don't even have an appetite for the kind of praise and affirmation that these religious leaders were thirsting for. It's beautiful. That's so compelling. And you know, if you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, listen, I'm not in that spot. I am a praise thirster. Here's what it means. It means that there's so much more joy in Jesus to be found. It means that you're hardly even scratching the surface. And the pathway to that joy It has a lot to do with quieting our hearts before the Lord. It has a lot to do with beholding Him in faith. The one who for our sake became sin, even though He knew no sin, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The one whom, though He was rich, for our sake became poor, so that we by His poverty might become rich. We instinctively know. Here's what we know. Everybody realizes that quietly content people are the ones who are really thriving. Don't you know that? The people that are waving their arms around and trying to get attention, they're not thriving. The people who are quietly content, they're the ones who are thriving. And you know, in Christ, that could be you. And you know, there there is some cost here. You know, there, there's something kind of buzzy about the, the, those hits of public affirmation for generosity or whatever the case may be. So there is some cost here. But even though there is a cost, here's what we do know. God will reward us. What kind of reward? There's a, several possible kinds of reward here. It's, it's a little tricky to, to pin down, but a few things I think are apparent that I'll mention, uh, certainly, I mean, God's fatherly approval, not salvifically, but more like the encouraging presence of a father who already loves you. Reward possibly meaning the satisfaction of seeing your generosity make an impact, which is what true disciples want anyway, instead of personal praise. And I would say this part is maybe a little bit speculative, but I think there's enough biblical evidence concerning this idea of of rewards for faithful disciples to say, 
you know, the intensity of our love for God here on earth, I think we'll have something to say about our enjoyment of heaven. I mean, if God is the chief prize in heaven, if he's the main show, it really seems like those of us who come to really, really, really treasure and prize God here on earth will be particularly pleased when they're in the kingdom of heaven eternally. Here's an encouraging word here. Just This is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll close. I actually think this is a really relaxing, kind of refreshing passage, and here's why. Church, it gives us permission to go out and be faithful and just not worry about who's seeing what and just not worry about who gets the credit. Isn't that refreshing? Very often when we're thirsting for public approval, basically we're getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. We're thinking to ourselves, you know what, I'm doing these righteous things. People need to see it. People need to see the church in action. And there might be faithful ways to reveal some of that. But here's the thing. You can read this passage and conclude, I can go out there and live faithfully, live generously, live sacrificially, and just not worry about the results. I can go out there and trust the Holy Spirit to do the Holy Spirit's thing, who, by the way, is way more effective than your social media platform. He will help the people who need to see this, see it. He will take what you're doing. He will take your faithfulness, and he will multiply its effects. Amen.